read this morning comes from question number 98, which reads as follows. Where is the moral law summarily comprehended? The answer to the catechism is that the moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, which were delivered by the voice of God upon Mount Sinai and written by him on two tables of stone and are recorded in the 20th chapter of Exodus. The four first commandments containing our duty to God and the other six, our duty to man. The Catechism asks where we find the moral law. We've been speaking about God's moral law and how he has revealed his will to his creatures. He's given his will to us in our first creation in Adam. And though we have fallen into sin, and that revelation of God's will has been disturbed by our sin, such that we cannot see it aright, nonetheless it is present there in all of creation. God speaks to us of our obligation and our duty before Him in the world that He has made. He has imprinted His law in our hearts. Our consciences bear witness to the fact that we have an obligation to obey God. But now we come to focus on the place where we most specifically find God's moral law expressed. We find that in the Holy Scripture, God's special revelation of Himself, given by the inspiration of the Spirit. And most particularly, we find that given in the Ten Commandments, found in Exodus chapter 20. Of course, you're familiar with what took place there at Mount Sinai. God came down to His people whom He had delivered from Egypt, and there He called Moses to come up from the camp come to the top of the mountain, and there God would reveal to him his law. God was the suzerain king. He was the great Lord who redeemed his people. Now, as their, both their creator and their Lord, he had every right to declare to them what obligations he would impose upon them. They, as those who were redeemed, should receive his law and respond accordingly. So the law of Moses, or excuse me, the Ten Commandments given in Exodus chapter 20, are grounded and rooted in God's redemptive work. God rescued his people out of Egypt, brought them to himself at Mount Sinai, and revealed his law to them. The law then was not given as a means by which they could obey that and earn favor with God and so enter God's kingdom. They were already redeemed by their deliverance from Egypt. God reveals to us uh, in this, that when he gives to us his law, it's not for the purpose of works salvation, not so that we can try to observe these commandments and keep them perfectly and earn a place in God's heaven, but it is the result of our being redeemed. He reveals his law to us. It's a blessing that God gives to his church. That being said, many argue against the thought that the law of Moses given in the Ten Commandments of the Law of God given in the Ten Commandments still holds for us today. We are the church. The Law of Moses, according to some, has passed away along with the Old Testament economy. Israel is no longer among us. The nation, is, as, as God's people, the theocracy has been done away with. The temple services are finished. And so the Law of Moses, particularly the Ten Commandments, no longer is over the believer. We are not under the law. It is said we are under grace. That much is true. We are no longer under the law as a sense of condemnation, as a means of works righteousness, whereby we might earn favor with God. We are under grace. We are saved by Christ's work. He kept the law for us. But the law that He kept was this law, the Ten Commandments. The righteousness that He provides us is a righteousness that accords with the Ten Commandments. It is God's law that governs Christ in His mediatorial work as our Redeemer. And therefore, it is also this very same law that governs all who are in Christ, all who are redeemed by Christ. We must follow after Christ by following in His law, by obeying what God has revealed. The law, the moral law, is not subsided or passed away. It continues us today. Yes, there are some changes in the New 
New Testament economy. We no longer worship on the seventh day of the week. We worship on the first day of the week. But that minor adjustment was already anticipated in the law. In the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy, Moses based the commandment to observe the Sabbath not just on creation as you find it in the Ten Commandments, but also in redemption, in the deliverance from Egypt. And so Moses anticipated the change that would come when we would be redeemed from our sin through Jesus Christ. When he delivered us from a greater bondage to sin and death, not simply to foreign power like Egypt. So the law of God continues with us today. We are obligated to observe that law through our union with Christ, the one who himself obeys the law for us. Some of the ways in which we are impressed by the, the uh, eternal nature of this law are first that it is delivered by the voice of God. God spoke these words to Moses. And so it comes directly from God to his leader, representative Moses, standing for us, the mediator. It has not come to us through a variety of people, but God himself speaks his word. But then second is written on two tables of stone. There are other ways in which God could have recorded his word. It could have been on parchment. But here it's recorded in stone so that we could know that it is to endure forever. God's law reflects his own character, who he is, what our obligations are before him. Now the Catechism divides the Ten Commandments into two sections. Sometimes when we look at the two tables of the law given to Moses, we think, well, the first four commandments reflect our duty to God are given on the one table of the law. And on the second table of the law, you have the second set of commandments, the six remaining that apply to our duty to each other. More than likely, God gave to Moses two complete copies of the law to entrust to the people of God. It's one law given to us. But there is clearly a focus at the beginning of the law on our duties to God, and the second half of the law on our duties to one another. We will explore those duties momentarily. But God here reveals that He is our Lord, and our first obligation is to Him. We must obey God before men. God comes first. Peter made that clear when he was challenged by the Sanhedrin to abandon this preaching of the Gospel. He said that we must obey God rather than men. That comes first. But if we obey God first, then we rightly see the way in which we are to relate to one another. Our obedience to God sets the playing field for our obedience or our love or service to one another. We need to keep that priority intact. So the law of God is given in the Ten Commandments. That is a summary of the law. This law continues with us today in the church. The Apostle Paul and others quoted from the various elements of the law and taught us that love is the fulfilling of the law. And you had in mind these Ten Commandments.